go. Somewhere morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to our home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, O oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll one more time. I'll fly away. Who the sun sets free 
is free indeed. I am free to run. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free. I am free. Let's go ahead and clap. I am free. I am free. I am free to run. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free to dance. I am free to live for you. I am free to live for you. I am free. I am free. Cause I am free. I am free. And I am free. Amen. 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 Well, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My name is Herman. And, uh, to my left is my, lively, my lovely wife, and I'm not going to introduce her, because everybody knows who she is. Everybody knows her. If anybody needs an introduction, it's me, because most people know me by Sandra's husband. So, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay, I'm okay with that. So, um, before I go on, uh, Sandra would like to share a scripture with you. So it says in Psalm 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be here with all of you. Uh, time to have the opportunity I have to worship and uh, praise God with all of you. I pray um, that you are encouraged in your souls to be here and to know that what being us together is pleasing to God. You know, also on that note, um, I have a lot to be uh, thankful for as well uh, and grateful. Uh, one of the things that stands out to me is being part of this church family, being part of the body of believers. You know, uh, Scott and, and Jake have been giving lessons to us on Sundays about the seven people that help, help get you to heaven. And uh, he's, they've spoken about the prophet, a prophet that kind of leads us and guides us, directs us, and sometimes redirects us to God. They spoke about the encourager. Well, within this body, I've, I've had brothers and sisters kind of redirect me to God. I've had brothers and sisters encourage me with their love, with their friendship, and with their prayers, and I'm truly thankful for that. So before we start uh, praying, um, I want to thank the church. You guys are awesome. You know, every year on this time, we have made a collection of food baskets that we give to the um, migrant um, um, workers uh, here on the East Coast. And today, we have the representative from a Riverside uh, County of Education that oversees the, um, the migrant workers. And she's going to come up. Her name is Julia uh, Urias. She's going to come up to thank you guys and kind of give you a share with you a little bit about the families that are receiving these baskets. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia Urias, and I work for the Riverside County Office of Education. Um, we, we educate in the whole Coachella Valley from Lake Paris to Blythe. Um, I currently educate in the Mecca Thermal Oasis um, area. This is going to be my third year coming here to your church. And it's an honor to be here because every time I come here, I do receive a message from the Lord. So um, I'm very grateful for you guys having me here. Our families uh, always appreciate everything that you guys do for them. Thank you. By the way, we uh, collected, uh, as a group, 17 baskets. So it's awesome. Thank you. All right, uh, let's, let's bow our heads. Father God, we, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your grace, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help us to be the men and women that you call us to be, Lord. I pray that our hearts will be open to the message. 
I pray that you will uh, work with every speaker to say exactly what you need for us to hear, Lord. To direct us, to redirect us, to guide us, to lead us, and to encourage us in the faith and the relationship that we have with you, Lord. We love you. We praise the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Let us sing uh, Sinking Deep. Save 
sweet a wretch like me. Oh, 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 oh I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the broken to life. You take our weakness, you set your treasures in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Oh, 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 I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes. Yourself down, raising up the broken to You know, it's, um, it's uh, funny how as you get older, uh, these songs kind of make you cry a little bit more than they ever did before. I imagine myself, once I get a full gray hair, I'm gonna, you're going to see me walking in with a box of tissues just to make sure I'm prepared for these songs. But um, my name is Gonzalo Herrera, and I get the privilege and honor to be able to share about communion with you guys today. And really take us to the cross, take us to Jesus, and, and see um, what he did for us and why we take communion. So what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to start off with sharing a story. And uh, 
of writ, something that recently happened this year, and I'm going to tie it into communion. So I have a group of friends that I hung out with in high school. And, you know, I'm sure you guys can relate. You have friends that you had a group of friends, whether they're in the past or even coworkers or even just here in the family of the church. There's a group of friends that you guys are really tight with. And even in your own family, some of us you would consider those are your tightest relationships. Well, I had this group of friends, and every once in a while I have a, a, someone that I'm hanging out with or someone that I connect with. And, uh, and recently I was able to connect with this, this, uh, this friend of mine. I see him probably every five years, and we go play golf. So we go play golf, and uh, we, we just catch up, and we're talking. And he's, um, you know, he's, he's a funny guy. He, starts at, he, he looks at my leg, my calf, and he says, hey, you have some scratches on there. What happened? And I said, oh, I said, um, I take this medicine that makes me uh, sometimes get a little itchy, and I scratch too hard. And then he goes, why do you take medicine? And I was like, well, okay. Um, I said, I was diagnosed with bipolar one years ago, and I take medicine to basically kind of stable me out to get me as healthy as I can mentally. And so, you know, he was asking questions. Well, how do you get it? And I said, sometimes it's genetic. Sometimes you... You have some brain trauma and different things that would happen for you to kind of get that going in you. And so he was just quiet for a few seconds, and then he says, I know exactly when you got bipolar. And I go, I was like, okay. He goes, no, dude, I know exactly when you got bipolar. I was like, all right. I said, okay, tell me the story. He says, he goes, he goes you probably don't remember, but it was when the time you got ran over by a station wagon. I was like, like, yeah, <laughs> okay, uh, so tell me some more what happened. He goes, well, we went, so he started telling me details. He goes, we were on the 10 freeway, uh, we ran out of gas, it was like six of us, we were in your brother's station wagon, you got off, and he's telling me details how I, we pushed the card, and then I fell, I hit my head on the door, I was ran over by the station wagon, and then just how I was knocked out, and no one, they, I was just out. They didn't even know if I was dead or alive, so he's telling me all these details, I'm going like, that's a lot of details, and this is a bad joke. You know, just kind of like, and I said, you know what? I, I didn't know how to feel. It was kind of like, it was funny, but it was not. And I said, hey, I said, okay. I said, why don't you prove, I said, you have until the end of the game to prove that this, your story is true. Because I, I didn't believe it, and I didn't want to believe it either. And he said, give me your, your brother's number. And so I gave him my, my brother's number. He, goes, he put it on speakerphone, and he said, he calls, and he says, hey. And he's all, what's up? And he says, uh, do you remember the time in high school when uh, your brother got ran over by the station wagon? And my brother says, yeah. And, um, you know, I, when I heard that, it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, what do you mean I got ran over and I've never known? Like, this was 30 years ago. These were my closest friends. How come I never knew this? What, what did it... Was that, that triggered my bipolar? Like, I had all these questions, and, and I, I, I didn't even, I don't even remember what I did the rest of the time there playing golf, but I remember leaving there, and it was Sunday, and I got on, my, on the car, and I was just praying to God, God, I don't want to hold any grudges against my friends or my brother. I don't want to hold back anything like that with them. I love them. Don't let me get bitter. But it was, it was just stirring in my heart, and... I prayed, I shared the stories with others, I've shared with some of you here, and I've, I've, it seems to, I always cry when I share it, but there's a lot of emotions wrapped up in it. And the thing about, um, is that I was devastated and crushed about my friends that did that to me. And I thought about, you know what, how does it, and I'm sharing with this because how does it relate to communion? If anyone had a close friend and a group of friends, it was Jesus. He had the most incredible family with him. These people were with him for years. They did everything together. My group of friends, we never were that close. There's no way we even got to that level. He, the degree that he had those relationships were far beyond what we will ever understand. This is a group of friends that he had that carried on the ministry, that carried on his, his, his purpose. And yet, he was abandoned by them when he needed them the most. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. 
one of the 12. He had just washed his feet prior to him going to the cross. And he approaches Jesus and gives him a kiss to hand him over to those who would kill him ultimately. Hear what he said right before the cross. He talk, he's talking to Simon, to Peter. He says, John 13, 36 says, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Jesus served these men like no one ever had. He devoted his life to them. But you need to understand that this wasn't the first time that God would see this devastation and this betrayal. You need to understand, you need to look at the bigger picture, and God has felt this from the beginning of time. Every single person, in one way or another, betrayed God, has turned away from him, abandoned him. And he feels. He allows his heart to feel, and it breaks his heart. Yet, in all this, he gives us everything for us, and he allows us to, and he gives us a time that even just a few would turn to him. With my brother and my friends, I had to understand and look at my life. It was so easy for me to say, I would never do that. I would never not take my brother to the hospital when he's knocked out like that. And I had to evaluate that. I go, have I ever betrayed anyone? Have I ever lied to anyone? Have I ever turned my back to anyone? And I, the truth was, yeah, I did. And I'm sure if you look back at your life, you have done it one point or another. So who are we to judge? Who am I to judge? And that gave me the understanding of grace and mercy and, and just to know that um, I can't judge for what anyone does. Jesus forgave as well, and he demonstrated in laying his life down for his disciples and for all. You know what he left his disciples? He said his command to the disciples was love one another. You have one another. And so when we take communion, what you need to understand is not only are we communion, the communion, uh, we commune with Jesus, not only do we connect with him and the cross and what he did, but communion is also for us to connect with each other, for us to remember the relationships that we have with one another here. And so let's pray. And what you need to, what I was thinking is the least we can do is love one another, and that's how we honor Jesus. Let's pray and uh, commune with Jesus right now. That means to connect with him and, each, and one another. Lord, I, uh, I just thank you, God, for the incredible blessing it is to be able to be at church today. Be able to take this communion, be able to remember the cross. Lord, you gave everything for us. You gave your life. You came to serve. You didn't come to this world to see what you could get out of it. But you came to this world to see what you were going to give to it. And you gave us everything. You showed us God and his love. You showed us the sacrifice that he gave us. You showed us, God, how to truly love one another and be devoted to each other. We pray, God, that we can honor you with this church, that we can honor you with our relationships and what we have in this time, that we can remember the cross and what we did on the cross and our sins what it did to Jesus. We pray for forgiveness. We ask you to help us to um, devote this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good afternoon, church. So for communion, I mean, sorry, the offering, uh, Gonzalo was so powerful. I still have that. And thank you, Gonzalo. I think that was awesome. Um, it was amazing. And uh, I'll just thank you for that. Um, next time I'll go before you, by the way. Um, so, so for offering, I'm going to read scripture. It's uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. If you could turn there, please. It says, uh, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And uh, just a thought, you know, while, you know, the, you know, the fallenness of man has interrupted God's original intention to provide uh, for his children, all of us, the story's not finished. God's response to the lack of provision and wealth in the world is to redeem the economic sphere so it again provides what everyone needs. So all things in the scripture include the economic sphere of our lives by extension to use us to help the world. And I think, you know, for, for all of us that give and you know help and you know there's many ways to do that yes monetarily and you know time you know leadership um i think it's awesome we have awesome examples in this church of just the givingness and and the willingness to serve and uh i just I'm glad to be a part of this and i just look amongst everybody and just see willing people and it's just awesome let us pray then, Father, just thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to give, God. Thank you for just, uh, we, we live in America, just uh, we're able to uh, live in uh, just a wealthy area, God, uh, according to the world, and be able to be in a position to help, God. Just multiply this money, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to give, and you've given us so much, God. Just thank you for the faith in us, and just we return to you uh, just by having the great faith, God, and just bless this offering. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, uh, for sharing your heart there in the word. Uh, right now, we're going to take up our monthly, as the trays are being passed, we're going to watch a video that's going to introduce our monthly hope offering. And so we're going to watch that now. No one, no man, no woman, no child should have to live in a world of fear, insecurity, and terror. Hopelessness is said to be more destructive than any weapon on earth. Far too many of our fellow man are living in despair. This, my friend, should not be. You see, we know how to bring hope to every single person on earth. When you acknowledge each person's inherent dignity, respect their humanity, and bring kindness, you bring them hope. And we know that when people have hope, they have a future. When you bring hope into a community, it transforms them. It changes everything. To bring a person or a family or a whole region from a place of desperation to a place of hope, you have truly made a difference. When you bring hope to somebody, you don't just change their day. You have revolutionized their world and their worldview. You restore faith in humanity and revive the belief that there are still good people in this world. We believe in a world where every single person has hope for their life and sees a brighter future. We are committed to fighting for everyone to have this hope in their life. Through compassion, excellence, and integrity, we will restore hope worldwide. Amen. Well, uh, Hope Worldwide is a global organization that this church uh, supports, and it's the benevolent arm for our churches around the world. They take care of global disaster. They have hospitals, two hospitals in Cambodia, clinics in Africa for the AIDS epidemic, and 
all over the, the world. Whenever disaster strikes, they're usually there. Uh, as some of you know, as a church, this year has been a special year where we've really tried to go after serving the poor in an extra special way. And I pray that uh, this is part of the way that you serve the poor is by giving to hope and by sacrificing to be able to encourage them. But more than that, uh, I believe God's goal is for us not just to, to give with our money, but to give with our heart. And to have it be something that affects our day-to-day -day life, not just here at church, not just when we go on a special quote-unquote serving day, but every day that we leave the house, that that's on our heart. And even before we leave, as it's in our prayers. And I know for me, uh, I still have a long way to go in that area. That a lot of days I leave the house and I'm not thinking about those in need. I'm not looking around to try to give someone an encouraging smile, to give them a cup of coffee, to uh, engage and, and provide the dignity that they're talking about. But I pray that that can be more of my heart at the end of this year and even next year. And that's really my prayer for all of us. In Proverbs 19, verse 17, it says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. And so I pray that we can have that on our heart. It's kind of a tough verse if you think about it. When you're kind to the poor, he rewards you. And I don't know where that sends your mind, but it sends my mind to, okay, when I'm not kind to the poor, then what does God do to me then? But I think it probably applies that he wants us to be open-handed and you know, today is a day where we're, we celebrate in a special way as we're able to help out the migrant workers and the amazing work that uh, Julia and her team are doing, you know, to give 17 baskets. To, and I hope that you feel that 17 families will be praising God because of you. That when they say their Thanksgiving prayer, and a lot of them have a lot of faith, that they will remember. They may not know it was from the church. They may not know who it was from, but they're going to be thanking God because of you. And in that way, God's going to reward you. He's not going to maybe send you a check, but he may send you some blessing as a result of that prayer that that person prayed. And I pray that we think about that uh, today as we give. I know as we went to Mexicali, there was 14 of us that went yesterday uh, from the Inland Empire, and, and uh, there was a family, the Arevalo family from the Riverside, and Jake happened to give them a text, and I had no idea that they were coming, and they came. It was awesome. They got to sing songs with the kids, and I uh, appreciate people here who gave. We raised like $600, and we're able to buy food for them. We're able to buy uh, about 10 really warm blankets. That was what they requested, and get to fill up these two uh, big propane tanks, uh, for them, that's where they get their heating source. And we looked over and out in their, the courtyard of the little place, and it was kind of two trailers back-to-back, -back, single-wide trailers. And 12 boys live in one trailer, and there's six bunk beds, one after the next, and they're maybe two and a half feet apart. And it's just six bunk beds, and then the other trailer's like a bathroom and like closet and like shared storage area. And I, we walked in, and I was like, wow. There is no personal space, that that's their life. They're all together. And I saw a barbecue, uh, a propane tank that we use for barbecues out in the, in, the, in the courtyard. And I was like, what is that? And it was hooked up through some kind of ingenious method to the wa hot water heater. Did they get fuel for the hot water heater through the propane tank? And to know that because of you guys, we're able to fill that tank up a few times. Uh, and that's how they get their heat. And it just really uh, was moving and touching to, to be able to spend time with them. And uh, it moved my heart. My, the highlight for me was we went to a playground. And they had one of those old school uh, tire swings with the chains, four chains coming down. And you can sit on them. And... Uh, the kids just took turns. They wanted to go on the tire swing, and ha you know how you twist it all the way up to the top, and then they just swing all the way around. 
And that was the highlight for me, just to see, it looked like, I mean, I was almost sick thinking about doing that myself. But for that time, they got to be kids. And you know, I know that in their life that they don't have that time as much as we want them to have to be kids, to swing on the tire swing and get dizzy and, you know, step, fall in the mud puddle and have a great time. Um, but that, for me, that was what was really moving, and really, I pray that today, as you give, that you think about your life, and you think about God's promise to really uh, be generous to those who, who remember the poor, not just with your giving, because I think that's kind of the least of it, but really with your year, that you'll think about your year of, wow, I want to be someone who stands up for the poor. I want to have that be something that moves my heart on a on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. So I believe that's what God ultimately wants for us, and our church is heroic in, in so many ways in this area. But uh, please consider this as you give and as you just think about your year and your next year uh, regarding the community. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to give, God, that we get to bring smiles to people's faces. God, I pray that you move our hearts and our, our mind and our spirit, God, to be, a, be people and be a church that really makes a difference in our community, God. Not just We want to thank you for today and just the amazing blessing that you've given us to be able to encourage uh, these 17 families. God, I pray that you just encourage them, not just with the food, but just to know that people are praying for them, that people care, and I pray that you bless them in every way. Be with Julia and uh, uh, her team as they continue to serve the less fortunate and be with all of us as we serve them for you. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for your continued sacrifice. We have one more hope giving for the year next month, so I uh, want to thank you in advance for the year. Uh, a few announcements as the baskets are passed here. want to let you know if you're uh, bought one of the seven people to help you to heaven books. Please find Jake so uh, you can get uh, get your book. I uh, wanted to let you know we are not. Uh, ha- I don't think we're having midweeks this week. Is that right? No family groups. Oh, we are having family groups. Okay, we're having midweeks by family groups this week. So uh, please see your family group leader for that. Next Sunday we will be back here uh, worshiping together. I wanted to let you know that this. Sean's going to come up and let you know about something else as well. But this Wednesday, we are going to be serving at the Galilee Center in Mecca, and we have six more spots for people. We're going to be giving out the Thanksgiving meal over there at 2.30 on Wednesday. So if you or your family are free, please uh, see me or text me. And then Sean has another uh, something to fill you in on and update you with. One of our awesome Hope representatives. Yay. Hi, family. Um, I was going to go on and on and on about how great you guys were, but it's really been said over and over again, and they only gave me a minute. So, (laughs) but I, (laughs) but I do. I I really do feel like um, each and every one of you that serves with your whole heart has been really encouraging to me um, over the last two years, and um, just it really um, lifts me up to be uh, serving with a body that serves and goes after it with your whole heart. Uh, with that said, Herman and I went to a um, Coachella Valley, um, I, I don't want to say rescue mission because that's always on my brain, but it's a Coachella Valley uh, Community Trust. And basically, it's an organization that is designed to foster our youth uh, by involving them in collaborative um, programs in the community. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to, uh, to, to hear about some really awesome organizations. There's a safe house, um, there's a pregnancy program, res- refugee pregnancy program, and then we also met an organization called Desert, uh, a Desert Ability Center, and they actually asked us uh, for volunteer help. So if anybody wants to, they're going to be having their 8th Annual Ability Festival on Saturday, December 14th at the Palm Desert Park. And it's going to be ha- uh, for all of the people with disabilities, with wheelchair races, uh, tennis, 
uh, mount, or rock climbing. I mean, it's a, it's a big event every year put on for the last eight years, and they could really use your help. So if anybody wants to sign up for that, we'll be in the back. You can talk to me or Herman or Sandra after church. And also, if anybody hasn't plugged in about where you want to serve, we are compiling a huge list of places that you could serve throughout the Coachella Valley. So thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. We're going to take a five-minute fellowship break. So when you hear the singing, uh, come on back in and start worshiping. Thanks.
Let's try to get back to our seats. We'll begin here shortly. You know that I feel good, good, good. Oh, I feel good. Oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, good, good. You know I feel love, love, love. Oh, I feel love. Oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel love, love, love. You know I feel joy, joy, joy. Oh, I feel joy, oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel joy, 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 joy. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel joy, 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 joy. All right, let's sing. This is Amazing Grace before Jake comes up to preach. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice Shines like the sun in All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, oh, oh Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Is the Lamb who was slain? Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is 
the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy to love. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. All right. Can you guys hear me all right? All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody. Glad to be here together. Um, you know what I actually want to do here right now, you know, with Thanksgiving being this week, what I wanted to do to start off our, our service is just to kind of have uh, a, a quiet meditation on gratitude. So what I, want, what I want to do is actually we're just going to kind of pause here for a minute just for you to quietly in your of yourself, pray, thank, you know, turn your attention to something you're grateful for, people you're grateful for, whatever, and let's have, let's have a time here just to kind of focus our minds on gratitude for a minute, and then I'll say a prayer and we'll get into the rest of the sermon, Okay. So let's just take a minute here, think about what you're thankful for, and say a prayer to God. God, I just really want to thank you so much for the chance to be here and to, uh, and to praise your name together. Uh, God, thank you for this time of year and the focus on gratitude. Uh, Father, I pray that, it, uh, that you will turn our hearts and our attention, not just on Thursday uh, and not just this one time of the year, God, but, uh, but in general that you will turn our attention to all that we have to be grateful for. Father, I know that you desire for us uh, to be grateful people, that you use gratitude to transform our hearts and our thinking. And so I pray... Uh, I, I do pray that, that, that even with this in mind, that you will turn, us, uh, turn our attention to you and to your word here uh, as, we, uh, as we engage with you tonight. We love you in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, amen. Well, uh, do you want to ask you just to keep Kelsey in your prayers? She's actually, uh, she's actually heading over to go see her doctor uh, right now. There's some concerns there, so just keep her. Uh, actually, I'm going to say a quick prayer for her. Just, I'm, I'm a little distracted. Uh, Father God, I do pray that you just have your hand over my wife and the baby right now. Uh, I pray, God, that you will give the doctors great wisdom, that you will, uh, that you will continue to protect them as you have uh, over, uh, over the last nine months and, and over the last week especially. Uh, I pray that you will, uh, you'll just uh, keep watch over them right now as they drive to the hospital. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm in a unique situation here. Never thought I would be in, but we're going to... We're going to move through this. My wife told me to go ahead and preach and that they'll keep me posted. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, just trying to listen to my wife, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so this is, this is going to be 100% out of weakness. <laughs> so, um, well, if you are joining us now, glad to have you guys. We are uh, in the middle of a preaching series that we've been doing, as Herman brought up, called Seven People Who Help You to Heaven. That the road to get to heaven is meant to be filled with relationships. And really that, that we need all these different types of relationships if we're going to make it to heaven. Uh, God never meant for this to be a lonely journey that we make by ourselves. That it's one that he, he designed to be filled with different types of people that draw us back to him and to his truth. And we're, we're about halfway through the series. And uh, we've covered a lot of different things. You know, Herman actually hit him, so I'm not going to say too much about it. 
But the last three that we've done so far is the visionary, the prophet, and the encourager. Uh, the visionary being somebody that, that sees God's picture in a bigger way than us, helps us to think with godly vision. Uh, the, the prophet, somebody that speaks the truth and love to us. And the encourager, somebody that, that draws us back to the truth, helps us to believe in ourselves when we're discouraged, all those different things. And uh, I want to just kind of open it up for a moment for people to share. No, we don't normally do this on a Sunday, like to save this for midweeks usually. But for people to share maybe what you've learned or something maybe you've tried to do differently as a result of the things that we've talked about so far in this series. Any hands? I know I'm surprising everybody. It's very uncomfortable. So just so maybe think about it. Like, what, have you, what do you feel like you've taken so far from what we've, what we've talked about over the last uh, several weeks? Go ahead, Sean. Okay. So just thinking through our relationships to see, you know, where those people are. Okay. Anything else? <coughs> Gonzalo. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Just following the example around me of people who encourage, making sure I pass it on. Okay, amen. Just noticing when people are encouraging that we got to encourage others as well, okay? Lewis, last one. Uh, you know, I, I think I went through this type of classes 20 years ago, but I have to remember early days of a disciple, and uh, I took it to the heart to have those kind of people in my life, and he helped me to go through my life as a disciple, and, 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 and I was, uh, I, I'm glad that I put that in practice in my life. So I want to encourage everybody to start looking in your life who are the missionary, the prophet, the encourager, because this will carry you. That's what God wants to do to fill ourselves and fill ourselves with people so we can help us in a walk with him. Amen. Amen. And yeah, like, like Lewis is saying, that the, really what this is designed for is for us to evaluate the relationships in our lives to see if you already have people in your life that are these things, then amen. And you need to, and we need to think about those relationships and be grateful for those relationships and take advantage of them. But if you're missing some of these relationships, or you feel like, man, I need, to, I need to go after getting a visionary in my life, then to pray and to really go after seeking those kinds of relationships to, to fill those gaps with us. And today we're going to be discussing the relationship. We're going to move on to the fourth one, the relationship of the advisor. And it's kind of on the heels of what we talked about when we talked about prophets, somebody that speaks the truth and love to you. Then an advisor is somebody, is somebody that gives you, uh, the, the, it's a relationship that we actively, where we actively seek wise insight, godly counsel, and practical advice in the decisions and challenges we face, we face both large and small. And you know, the Bible is very clear that we need this relationship. We need, we need, matter of fact, the Bible actually talks about we don't just need one of these types of people. You need lots and lots of these kinds of people. This is one of the few relationships specifically that we're talking about of the seven that says, man, you need many of these. The Bible is full of examples of advisors. And it's a major theme of the book of Proverbs. It talks about, man, if you have plans. It doesn't talk about, man, if you want to make it to heaven. He says, if you have plans of any kind, they succeed with advisors. God wants us to be successful in life, but he wants it to be through godly advice. And to get into this discussion, I want to start by looking at the importance of what wisdom is in the Bible. And in the book, Sam gives a really, really cool definition of what wisdom is actually supposed to mean. I'm going to show you here in just a second. What wisdom is, if we look at the godly examples of it, is it's practical and effective application of the Bible in specific life situations. So let's clarify that here for a second. So wisdom is not intellect. It's not being smart. It's not how well you know scriptures. You can know the Bible forwards and backwards, be the smartest one in the room, and be the least wise person in the room. Wisdom has way more to do with our ability to discern life and our choices and apply scriptures to it. So it's not book smart. 
It's the ability to know, man, this is how God would want me to use the Bible in this circumstance in my life. I want to look at, at some Proverbs here real quick. So if you got your Bible, turn over to Proverbs chapter 3. So you know that, uh, that Solomon, Solomon was considered one of the greatest kings of all time. He loved wisdom, and wisdom was a big theme of Proverbs. We're going to pick up in verse 13 here. And then we're going to skip over to the next chapter and read another piece of this. All right, in verse 13 of Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold, fast, hold her fast will be blessed. Now skipping over to chapter 4 real quick. In verse 5. It says, Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. We'll stop there. So in the first passage here, Solomon paints a very poetic picture of how valuable wisdom is. You know, the Bible always describes the best and most valuable things as a sheet. You notice that? God places high, high value on a she. There's no dollar amount to the value of wisdom is what the Bible is telling us. There's no amount of money you will ever own that could replace the value of wisdom. I love how it describes in chapter 3, it says that wisdom is a tree of life. It produces peace. No matter how much money you have, you can never buy peace. It says it produces honor. Again, no matter how successful you are in life, you don't necessarily have honor. Wisdom is the road to this. And then in chapter 4, Solomon even doubles down. He calls wisdom supreme. And he says, and it's worth everything you have. Make her a top priority of your life. And he says it will affect every single area of your life that counts. Not just your spiritual life. Your academic life, your careers, your marriages, your families, all of your relationships. Wisdom is supreme. It's worth everything you have. It is key to living a life of righteousness. But the Bible says that one of the main paths to wisdom is advisors. God's word is perfect. Amen? Amen. And it gives us all the principles of holiness and righteousness that we need in life. But it doesn't address every specific situation or circumstance in our day-to-day -day life, does it? The Bible doesn't tell you what to do with your smartphones or your 401ks. The Bible doesn't tell us what to do about a lot of specific things in our life. So what does God do? God sends others who are full of the Spirit to fill in those gaps. In Proverbs 19, verse 10, it says, Listen to advice. And accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. The key to wisdom is by trusting spiritual advisors in our lives. If you're going to be wise in life, if you're going to enjoy the fruits and all the values of wisdom, you need some good advice. But as true as this is, it's also hard for us to seek and take advice. Right? And it, really, this goes back to even our very first sermon when we talked about God's plan. You know, he says, God's perfect plan. Does anybody remember what it was? God's perfect plan is one imperfect person helping another imperfect person make it to heaven. But there's a problem with that. That means I've got to trust imperfect people to give me godly advice. 
So if I'm going to be wise, as God tells me to be wise, I have to trust God to use you, imperfect person, to help me to be wise. And I don't know about you in life, but I've also gotten some bad advice. I've gotten a lot of bad advice. Every time I go to a store that offers me a credit card, I'm getting bad advice. Right? Television is full of bad advice. A lot of the friendships that I've had in my life gave me bad advice. But really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change that fact that God still uses one imperfect person to help another imperfect person to make it to heaven. Actually, in Ephesians, what, God, what Paul communicates to us about our relationships is that we submit to one another, not because you're worth it and you're so valuable and you're so smart and you're so wise. It's that I submit to you out of my reverence for Christ. But the truth is we, re- we resist advice for two reasons, and only two. All right? The first reason is folly. Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says, The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. What folly really communicates, what it really is for us, is we don't know how much we don't know. Do you know how much you don't know? No. Sound like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. I didn't mean that on purpose. (laughs) That really the reality is, is, is folly means we don't even think about getting advice about things in our life. Oftentimes until it's too late. And I'm sure if you go back to your life, especially when you were a teenager, that tends to be full of opportunities to learn folly. That you can think of stories where you were like, man, that, was, that probably would have been a really good time for me to go get some advice. You know, when, when Kelsey and I had first, uh, we were about a year into our marriage, we got our first credit card. And uh, yeah, all good stories start there, right? Um, <laughs> And we went to a, 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 a store that was nearby that was selling televisions because we only had this little bitty, you know, glass old school, like the back is like that deep, you know, television and stuff. So like, hey, let's, let's go for an upgrade. And they had a sale on a, on a 42-inch plasma screen. And I didn't want to do their financing, so I did the math and, you know, I worked it all out and stuff. I was like, okay, I'm going to buy it on our credit card. And in three months, it'll be paid off. Right? Three months. It was planned. You know, I thought through it, I thought, and then Kelsey's job situation changed, and then my job situation changed, all within that three months, and that three months ended up being more like eight or nine. And we were, we were working on credit card debt all during that time because we didn't get any advice. I look back on that and go, man, that was folly. I was a fool. It was something as simple and small as the television, but... It ended up dramatically affecting my life if I had just been smart enough to get advice. The other reason, and maybe the more important reason for us to pay attention to, the reason why we don't get advice is pride. Proverbs 13, 10. When there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Pride tells us we think we know better. We trust ourselves more than we trust others. Maybe even to some degrees kind of legitimately, right? That maybe you did get some bad advice through your life. And so you say, man, I can't really, I don't know how much I can really count on people. And so it's, I'm better off trusting me and I just got to live with my consequences. But we don't trust, what that means is though, is that we don't trust God. It has nothing to do with people. It means we don't trust God to use the people in our lives to help us. God used a donkey to save Balaam's life. He can use one of you. Amen. He can use me. But the other side of it, too, is that oftentimes we don't get advice because we just don't want to hear what we don't want to hear. Right? I want people to agree with me. I want, I want, to, hear, I want to hear that what I, what I want to do with my life, it's right, it's good. Keep on going, Jake. You know, one of the best ways to tell if this is getting in the way of this is asking ourselves a question. How often do you seek advice? How often do you seek out godly people to give you advice about things in your life? If the answer is not very much, then I'll bet that's your problem. 
But I want us to look at an example in the Old Testament to help us consider this. To consider what happens when we do trust godly advisors. Turn your Bible over to Exodus chapter 18. So this is the Israelites. They're out, of, they're out of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. Moses' father-in-law hears how things are going, and he stops in for a visit. He's hanging out with his son-in-law. Let's pick up in verse 7. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships that they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord has done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people of the, from the hand of the, of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a, a burnt offering, and other sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you, why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and those people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Let's pause there for a moment. All right. So the Israelites are out of Egypt, going to the promised land, and God had been doing some awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Manna was falling from the sky every day. Water had come out of a rock. Uh, they had just finished beating the Amalekites in their first major battle. It's the story of Moses raising his hands up, and when his hands were raised, they were winning the battle. When his hands would fall down, they would lose, and they won the battle. So God had done some pretty incredible things up to this point. And he's clearly showing favor to Moses and to the Israelites. And so he shows up, Jethro shows up to encourage him and praise God together. But in that process, he stumbles upon a little practice that Moses had gotten into. That he had, been, he had basically been in the habit of being Judge Judy for the Israelites. It says they would bring disputes to him on a daily basis. Okay, now... Mind you, there are millions of Israelites, millions of them, and Moses is being the one guy for all of Israel to solve problems. Just imagine that. Imagine that every day you went to go sit up in your chair while you listened to domestic disputes, this person didn't pay me this, this guy stole my sheep, like every little thing that could go wrong, that's what Moses was taking care of. So naturally, his father-in-law is looking at this going, what are you doing? This is stupid. And he starts asking some questions. He wasn't, that, he wasn't that blunt and unrighteous like me. He starts asking some questions. But I want us to keep in mind something here before that. Moses had been directly communicating with God through this whole process. Okay? Think about the burning bush. The plagues. God had been directly speaking to Moses, had been doing things through him all during this process. Okay, so God was, or Moses was literally God's chosen instrument at the time. And that's even part of why people were going up to him because they're like, hey, we trust that God is speaking through you and we want to do things God's way. So we're going to come to you with everything big and small. So Jethro, Jethro sees this and says, this is a bad plan. Not a good idea, guys. You're going to wear yourself out doing this every day. Maybe Moses had gotten it into his head at the time that nobody else could do it. 
Maybe he thought, I'm the, I'm the only guy. God's the only, only talking to me, so maybe I'm the guy that's got to solve it all. Maybe there was a little bit of pride and some ego involved. You know, maybe he kind of liked being the guy. You know, we all kind of like being the guy or the girl. You know, being the one that people come to and ask questions to. There's a little bit of ego that gets stroked in that. Right. Think about the times of your life that you did something, though, with the best of intentions. Right? With good intentions. You, you planned to, to do something you thought would maybe be righteous or maybe be good for your family or good for your business. Whatever it may be. But then you realize later on, dude, that was not the right call. So what God did here is he used Moses' father-in-law, who is not speaking directly to God or performing miracles like Moses, to show up and give him advice. Let's, let's finish reading what he says here. We left off at 18. It says, listen now to me, and I will give you some advice whether it was welcomed or not. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. But teach them, teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way to live and how they're to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for, all the people at all time, for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his, own, to his own country. All right. So Moses gets advice, and the advice is, look, dude, you got to delegate some of this stuff. There's millions of people here. You can't be the guy for everything. You know, we might look at this situation and go, duh. This wasn't a good plan to begin with, right? But remember, Moses was speaking directly with God, and Jethro wasn't. He could have looked at this situation as father-in-law's unwelcomed advice, maybe, or uninvited advice would be a bit better way to say it, and said, who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? Are you saying my plan is stupid? I know what I'm doing, and it's been working so far. Just back off. I got this. But if he had, he would have missed out on what God was trying to teach him through someone else. And if you know the story of Moses, eventually he snapped. Right? Moses struggled with this more than once. It actually shows up in numbers and God has to remind him to do the exact same thing that Jethro told him to do here. Matter of fact, he tells him, you need to pick the people that you've already picked to do their job. And later on, when he's going frustrated with the people, he smacks the, the rock for water again, and he gets kept out of the promised land in the process. But you know what? If he hadn't listened to his father-in-law here, maybe that would have happened a whole lot sooner. You could imagine that dealing with millions of people on a daily basis, you would probably get a little worn out. Feel like, you know, I don't really want this job anymore. Bump you guys, here's your water. You know, the Lounsbury's, Stephen Carey Lounsbury, are leaders uh, out in our church in, in L.A., but they, uh, they were in a discipling relationship with my wife and I for years and years. And when we were still dating, I remember we got together with them. And, uh, and we had moved out from Florida. You know, she'd followed me about a year later and stuff like that. And we had issues in our dating relationship. Lots of issues. And one of the things that they encouraged us to do is we were going from a situation where we were around each other like every day, whether we wanted to be around each other or not. And the Lounsbury's advice, basically, as you know, I'm, I'm dumbing everything down to, one of the things that they told us to do was spend less time together and you will feel more connected to each other. Spend less time together just thinking about you and your relationship. Do more things where you're thinking about God, 
where you're giving to other people, have, go on awesome dates, really have time where you give to each other, make them special, but spend way less time together than you're doing. Everything about the logical brain said, this isn't going to work. I'm going to feel closer by not being with her. You get my logic, right? I mean, that makes sense. So I've kind of fought the advice. We kind of like had to wrestle with it a little bit. But after doing it, doing what they said, we started realizing this works. This actually was really good spiritual advice. This thing that was contradictory to everything that my nature wanted, everything that, that people would tell you is normal and will help you to be close together, was doing the opposite of what we wanted. And you know, and if we hadn't listened, there's no telling where our relationship would have been at the time, where it would be now. But it took somebody that was more spiritual and wise than me to tell me to see, you know, the way that you're thinking about this, it's wrong. And if you don't change it, you're going to hurt your relationship. And the truth of the matter is, this is the great example about why we need spiritual advisors in our life. We're not made to figure this all out on our own. I want to be a great husband, but to my nature, I'm not a great husband. I want to be a great father, but you know what? I've never raised three kids before. I need a lot of help if I'm going to do this righteously. And so I want, to, I want to wrap up here by going through some practicals with this, because I know, I know this can be a touchy subject. How we feel about advice it can make us feel a lot of different things. So I want to go through a, couple, a few practicals here together. All right, let's talk about what advice doesn't mean. Advice does not mean that all advice is good or right. It doesn't mean that everything somebody tells you is the way you ought to go, which bleeds into the next point, because not every advisor is a good advisor. In Proverbs 13.10, it says, you walk in the way of fools, you're going to be a fool. You walk in the way of the wise, you'll be wise. You know what that tells me with what we're talking about? You could get advice from some people who stink at advice. So it's a good thing to consider. It doesn't mean that everything that somebody tells you is what you ought to follow. You ought to consider who your advisors are. I want you to think, actually, going back to that here, this is the last, I'll bring this up. So you think if, if you have chest pain, you don't go to a doctor who specializes in feet, right? You know, if you're, feeling, if you're feeling chest pain, you don't go see a dentist. No offense to Lewis. He's a very smart man. You need to seek people that are spiritual and you can consider their way of life and the outcome of what they've been living. All right? The next thing, it does not mean you just accept everything blindly. What do I mean by that? It, taking advice doesn't mean you don't ask questions. It doesn't mean you don't express concerns. It doesn't mean you don't have doubts. All those things are a part of getting advice. And also, it doesn't mean that you don't pray about it. What James 1 says is it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he ought to pray and ask the Father who gives it generously. You know one of the things I try to do is I try to pray about the people I want to go get advice from. God, I pray that you will help this person to give me advice that will lead me to you. Amen. And then I go get to pray about it before I make my own decision. And the last thing, advice does not mean that you get to blame others. Right. Advice does not mean it's their fault because they told me I ought to do it. Advice means you've got to take responsibility. You get advice, but then you've got to own your decision. Whatever that decision is, it's yours. You don't get to blame your advisor afterwards. All right? Next practical, who are some good advisors? Romans 15, 14 actually gives us a nice little blueprint for this. It says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. This is basically Paul saying, these are the kind of people you want to get advice from. People who are full of goodness, who are filled with knowledge, who are competent. That means they know what they're talking about. You know, I want to clarify here. 
The internet should not be your primary source of advice, <laughs> especially about things that matter. You know, if you go to WebMD because you're worried about something, that's fine. But when it comes to life, raising your kids should not be based on what you read on a mommy blog. It doesn't matter if it seems good at the time. You don't get to measure how they're actually raising their kids. You know, I love my family, but my family is not always the people I need to get advice from. Your family doesn't necessarily guarantee that they should be your primary advisors. And it definitely shouldn't be people who only tell you what you want to hear right. and who won't challenge you. Amen? Amen? All right, last little thing here. This is for the people that are trying to give advice. Okay? When you're advising, number one, don't be quick to air out your own opinion. Proverbs says that fools are quick to air out their own opinion. Sometimes the best thing for you to do is keep your mouth shut and you go, bro, I'm going to pray for you. And you don't need to tell everybody what you think. As part of that, you got to know when you aren't the right person. You know, sometimes when people come to me with questions about retirement, I'm not the right person to ask. So I often direct them to other people. You know, it's a wise thing to go, you know what, bro? You know, sis, I would love to help you here. This is not my area of expertise. I would recommend you go talk to this person. They've done great with this. They can totally help you out with that. And the last thing is don't get your feelings hurt. If somebody doesn't take your advice, so what? So what? That doesn't mean don't give advice. It doesn't mean you're not competent. People got to make their own choices. You know, I was going to list all these things that you should get advice about. I'm just going to say this. It should be about everything, <laughs> big and small, from your spiritual life and your walk with God to your important relationships, to career choices, to how much money you should give on a Sunday, to, to how your finances do overall. Every area of our life, guess what? God says that anybody who wants to have their plan succeed will get advice. Amen. Seek it out. I want to encourage this church if you are not in the habit of seeking advisors, if maybe you've gotten out of the habit, you know, you kind of got some feelings hurt along the way, were disappointed by some things, and you've just gotten out of the habit, or maybe you've just never been good at it, let's change that around. Because I want this church to be full of wise people, and we got a lot of wise people in this room. But we need advisors if we're going to be successful in all the things that we do. I'm going to say a word of prayer here, and we're going to close out. Father, I just want to thank you so much that, uh, that you have allowed us the opportunity to enjoy all these different relationships that help to pull us into righteousness. God, I pray that, that, that we will be men and women who are wise, that we will be people who, who seek godly advice. Father, I pray that you, will, uh, that you will fill us with your spirit, help us to, to be a church that, that loves each other and helps to lead each other to the truth. We love you so much. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. if that works. Here we go. You know, I appreciate that spurring on for, to get us all thinking about how can we get advice. And that really, uh, to me, is really the whole point of this entire series is to help us to see that we need people in our lives. If you want it in a nutshell of why I like this series, and there were a lot of other people that liked it too, but it's like, it shouldn't be that the, the wise people have to track all of us down to give us their w wisdom. It should be that in, your, in our, our own lives that there's areas that we know that we need help with and we go seek that out. And I pray that that is uh, who we become. I love, uh, appreciate what you said there, Jake. I, the, the thing that stuck out to me was where Jethro said, what you are doing is not good, 
right? That's like the last thing we want to hear, right? What you're doing, that's not good. Is this what you're doing? Oh, that's not a good thing. But what it made me think of is what those, the, the areas that you would say, this is not good, that's what you need to get advice about. It usually has to do with relationships, jobs or money, family, especially now as we're going into the holidays, or even how can I help others? You know, and so my, my challenge and encouragement, like Jake said, is to go think about your life, pray about your life. What are the areas that I need to get help with? And God wants to lift you up in those areas. He wants to give you answers, you know, in prayer. My, my, I'm not going to give you a lot of advice here. I'm tempted to, but my advice when you get advice is to decide what you think you should do and then go ask somebody else who's maybe wiser what they think you should do so that it's not just I do whatever Ramsey told me to do. No, I come with my opinion, you give me your opinion, and then I think I can see, wow, I was actually headed in the right direction. I just needed some confirmation that that was a good idea, or I could see, wow, okay, I'm glad I came to you because I was going to do this, and I probably would have messed it up. You know, so that, that's my short uh, bit of uh, encouragement for all of us. Uh, thank you again, Jake. Let's give it up for Jake. Um, we are actually outside getting, giving advice and getting advice five minutes before the sermon. Should Jake preach this sermon, or should he go to the hospital now? We talked to all the women involved, including his wife, and they said, okay, stay. And now it's like, okay, now you can leave. I don't know if he's going to leave right now, but he might. Okay, there you go. So uh, pray for him. Uh, <laughs> you know, pray for Kelsey. Pray for the baby. Just pray that he comes out now. Let's do it, right? Sunday, it's a good day for a baby. Uh, so we're going to close out with a prayer here. Uh, we have some encouraging news to share with you that right after the service, we are going to have a, a baptism among us. A special family member, Ron Carver, is going to be making Jesus Lord of his life today. So uh, stick around. That's going to happen right outside afterwards. Are we going to have the sharing in here or out there? Okay, we're going to have the sharing out there. So after service, about 10 minutes after, if you want to be a part of that, you can go outside and join us. Let's pray, and we'll close out. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for this day to be together. Thank you that you have provided your word that, that in that makes us uh, e even possible to be used as advisors for you. God, thank you that you can use our weaknesses to advise others, that you can use our strengths to advise others. God, I pray that we can uh, be a church that does rely on one another, that does uh, encourage one another. God, help us to seek out the relationships that you've put there for us. God, they truly are more precious than gold. Thank you so much for Ron as he's coming to uh, be baptized today, God. I pray that you bless him and just make this time as he comes to you even more special than he could have imagined. We love you. Be with the, our week that we can be grateful for all that you've given us. We, love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed. <laughs>